I'm Miss Killian, and this is Lesson 6. In this lesson, we are going to continue reading the next chapter, or second inning, of We Are the Ship. Do you have what you need? You should have your journal and something to write with. You also could have a copy of the text, We Are the Ship, if you have it. Let's begin today by reading the jacket summary. That's found on the inside of the book cover, right in here. In our last lesson, we noticed the use of we, and we wondered who was the narrator. The jacket summary is going to reveal more about the narrator. Listen carefully as I read aloud the jacket summary, thinking, who is the narrator? The story of Negro League Baseball is the story of gifted athletes and determined owners, of racial discrimination and in international sportsmanship, of fortunes won and lost, of triumphs and defeats on and off the field. Most of all, the story of the Negro Leagues is about the unsung heroes who overcame segregation hatred, terrible conditions, and low pay to do the one thing they loved more than anything else in the world, play ball. Using an everyman player as his narrator, Kadir Nelson tells the story of Negro League Baseball from its beginning in the 1920s through its decline after Jackie Robinson crossed over to the majors in 1947. The voice is so authentic, you will feel as if you are sitting on the dusty bleachers, listening intently to the memories of a man who has known the great ball players of that time and shared their experiences. But what makes this book so outstanding are the dozens of oil paintings, breathtaking in their perspectives, rich in emotion, and created with understanding and affection for those lost heroes of our national game. We Are the Ship is a tour de force for baseball lovers of all ages. In that summary, there's mention of the every man. Who is the every man player? that Kadir Nelson refers to as the narrator. Let me read this section again as you think about it. Using an everyman player as his narrator, Kadir Nelson tells the story of Negro League Baseball from its beginning in the 1920s through its decline after Jackie Robinson crossed over to the majors in 1947. The voice is so authentic, you will feel as if you are sitting on dusty bleachers listening intently to the memories of a man who has known the great ball players of that time and shared their experiences. Hmm. Is the everyman player real or an imaginary person? Huh. Some of my students in the past have shared that they think the everyman player is a collection of different players' experiences, a voice of an imaginary man. So, how does knowing the narrator is an everyman help you understand or organize what's happening in the book? Pause the screen to think about that third question on your screen. Knowing that the narrator is an everyman player helps us because we understand it's not just one, person ex one person's experience, but it's the experience of many players. We also now know who the narrator is when they refer to we, that that we is sharing his experience along with others. In our lesson today, we are going to focus on this question. Read it with me. What's happening in second inning of We Are the Ship? 
In the previous lessons, we've noticed and wondered about the first chapter, first ending. We've also began to compare and contrast the Negro League's unique play style with the major leagues. Today, we're going to organize what's happening in second inning by reading and summarizing the text. Listen as I read aloud the chapter title and quotation on page 17 of We Are the Ship. And of baseball, Negro League game play. What do you think a different brand of baseball or tricky means? If you're working with a family member or friend, you can share that response now. As we read today, we're going to find out. Next, you're going to read second inning. And while reading, you will annotate for details that describe the type of baseball played in the Negro Leagues. I'm going to ask you to annotate throughout this arc and throughout this module. When we talk about annotating, that means you're taking notes as you read to help you engage with the text and to monitor your understanding. Each time I ask you to annotate, I'm going to give you a specific purpose, a specific thinking task that you need to do. Today, you will be annotating to note details and describe the style of baseball played in the Negro League. All right, now you know what you're annotating for. So if you have that text, open up to second inning, page 17. If you don't, I'm going to read aloud and you can follow along. I'm also going to stop and remind you to do your annotating work. Let's get reading. Second inning, a different brand of baseball, Negro League game play. We had some white umpires from another league call our game once. Those poor fellows didn't know what to do with themselves. They made so many mistakes. They came over and apologized after the game. They said they couldn't help it. They never seen our type of baseball. Said if they played like we did in the majors, they'd have to make the parks bigger to see all the fans. We played a different brand of baseball from the majors. Negro baseball was fast, flashy, daring. Sometimes it was even funny, but always very exciting to watch. People would come early to the ballpark just to see us practice. We would whip the ball around the infield with such precision they'd applaud. I want you to pause now and think. What annotations can you write down about the style of play in the Negro League? See if you can think about that now. All right, let's keep reading. We took pride in our baseball, brought our own style to the game, and named our teams to match, called ourselves the Baltimore Elite Giants, the Philadelphia Stars, the Birmingham Black Barons, the Cleveland Buckeyes, the New York Cubans, the Atlanta Black Crackers, and many more. And we could play like we invented the game. Kept the fans on the edge of their seats. That means they were excited. Turned signals into, turn sing, uh, singles into doubles and doubles into triples just by running hard. We use Rube Foster's butt and run game to perfection. They don't bump much today and it kills us. Some guys would clown on the field, throw the ball behind their backs and get the guy out at first, or play shadow ball where the infielders would whip an imaginary ball around the bases. If you didn't know any better, you'd have thought they had a real ball. Lloyd Pepper Bassett used to catch some games in a rocking chair. 
Willis Jones used to take a newspaper with a hole in it out to center field and pretend he was reading it. If his team was way ahead and the ball was hit out there, he wouldn't go after it. One of the other guys would have to kill himself trying to get it. A lot of guys didn't like all that comedy because to us, baseball was serious business. It was our means of putting food on the table. But truth be told, some of that stuff was funny. There were a couple of guys, Reese Goose Tatum and Richard King Tut, who were with the Indianapolis Clowns. They had a routine where Goose played the dentist and Tut the patient. Tut would fill up his mouth with corn and Goose would act like he was pulling on Tut's tooth, but it wasn't coming out. So Goose went and got a firecracker and lit it in Tut's mouth. As soon as it went off, Tut would jump up hollering and spitting out that corn like his teeth were falling out. He had people on their backs with laughter. They would do the same thing every night. Most of the clowning was done in the early days of Negro baseball, before Rube founded the league. The teams that clowned were not allowed in the league because their acts were too much like the buffoonery you would see in the movies. That's like silliness. Back then, the movies made full-grown Negroes look like fools or children, always telling jokes or dancing. Most of the time, it was white folks made up to look like Negroes. It was downright shameful, but still, people would come out to see Negro teams like the Indianapolis Clowns play. They were a good draw. They had some good players on that team, too. Did you know that the major league home run champ Hank Aaron played with the Clowns before he went up to the majors? We didn't really know how rough it was in the Negro Leagues until some of our guys went up to the majors. Play was a lot nicer there. In our league, everything was legal. We would do whatever it took to win. Pitchers threw anything and everything. Spitters, shine balls, emery balls, cut balls, you name it. They cut that ball to pieces. It had curve balls breaking about six feet. Throw a new white ball to the pitcher and it would come back down from all the tobacco juice and what have you. I want you to pause now and I want you to think about your annotations. See if you can record some annotations for this page 18. You never knew what the ball was going to do once it left the pitcher's hand. And throwing at a batter was common. The pitcher would knock you down just to mess with your head. Look up at the umpire and he'd just say, get up and play ball, son. That's why the batting helmet was invented. When Willie Wells was just a rookie, that means he was just beginning, he found the ball was making its way toward his head a little more often than he liked. So he decided to wear an old miner's helmet when he stepped up to the plate. Boy, did they laugh at him. But today, you won't find, find a ball game played without a batting helmet. Base runners would spike you in a minute. Some of those guys would spike their mother if she were blocking home plate. A catcher learned not to block the plate if a runner was coming home. Get in the runner's way and he'd step on the catcher's foot or he would run him right over. Knock all his gear clear off. Come sliding in with his cleats high Cleats are what they wore on their feet. Runners could tear your uniforms off with those spikes. Some of those guys would sit in the dugout before the game, filing their spikes. Look at you and say, this is for you.
<gasps> they would sharpen those spikes. Wow. Are you noticing some details about the Negro League? If so, make sure you're recording your annotations. Those guys were mean, and many of them loved to fight. Oscar Charleston was a mean son of a gun. He would just go, he would just about go looking for trouble. One time he snatched, that means to sneak up, to steal, the hood off a of Ku Klux Klansman. Judd Wilson loved to use his fists too. Many close games ended with a fight. We didn't really have any spring training. We had to learn to play on the field. By springtime, we had already been playing down in Cuba or Mexico all winter. There wasn't any break. Soon as spring hit, we had paying customers. Games would last only about 2 hours and 15 minutes. Not like those long games they have today, which can go about 3 hours or more. None of that stepping in or out of the batter's box or stopping to have a word with the manager. We came to play. The ball we played with was a Wilson ball, which wasn't as lively as the expensive ball they used in the majors. Could you imagine all the home runs Josh Gibson or Norman Turkey Stearns would have hit if we'd had that kind of ball? And we bought our bats straight off the shelf. Major leaguers made, had theirs made. Stop and think. What did you learn so far about play in the major, in the uh, Negro Leagues? Let's keep reading. Umpiring wasn't always that great either. Some of those guys wouldn't have known a strike from their left foot. At one time, the league had official umpires, but they couldn't travel with the teams. The umpires are the people who make the calls in the game. So they tell when a ball goes out or when there's a strike. They are not players. It was too expensive. A few of the umpires were former players. Pop Lloyd and Wilbur Bullet Rogan used to ump later on in their careers. Those guys were tough. They had to be. With guys like Oscar Charleston and Judd Wilson in the league. At one game in Kansas City, there were three umpires. Rogan was behind home plate with the two others. And the two of them were at first and third. A play took place at third base and Rogan ran down the line. He called the man out, and the base umpire called him safe. They started to argue and got into a fight. Bullet Rogan pulled out a knife, and the other guy panicked and took off running toward the center field fence, and he climbed over it. The next day, it was in the papers. Rogan had a bad temper. We wouldn't argue too much with him about balls and strikes. Whatever he called you, you just let that go. He was old, but he'd fight you anyway. Some guys even played with a gun in their uniforms. It was a rough league. Record some more annotations. And stats. Stats are statistics. They're used in baseball to help keep track of a player or a team. And stats, well, some teams kept them, but it wasn't a consistent thing. Most guys kept their own stats, or if a player on the team was keeping them, a bit of the information was lost when he had to bat or play in the field. Occasionally, a local newspaper would send a reporter out to keep stats, but the papers wouldn't pay them to do it very often. Sometimes those guys would come late and have to ask around, what happened in the first inning? Who did what? Or they'd just make up the stats.
even when the stats were recorded, they weren't always phoned in or it was too much to try to stop and find a mailbox on the road while we were headed for the next town. Shoot, the white papers wouldn't run our scores anyway. Stats weren't consistently kept until later, after Jackie Robinson went up to the majors. Okay, you should be sure you recorded your annotations. I'm curious what you annotated. If working with someone else, share your annotations that describe the type of baseball played in the Negro Leagues. You can pause the screen to share. Now we're going to try to figure out what's happening in this chapter by rereading and answering some questions together. You'll need your journal for this part. On the screen, you will find page 17. You can also open up to page 17 if you have your text. I'm going to reread the first two paragraphs on page 17. And as I do, I have a thinking job for you. I want you to read this question and think about this question as I read. Why did the umpires make so many mistakes when calling a Negro League game? As I read, Think about that question. We had some white umpires from another league call our game once. Those poor fellows didn't know what to do with themselves. They made so many mistakes. They came over and apologized after the game, said they couldn't help it. They never seen our type of baseball said if they played like we did in the majors, they'd have to make the parks bigger to seat all the fans. We played a different brand of baseball from the majors. Negro baseball was fast, flashy, daring. Sometimes it was even funny, but always very exciting to watch. People would come early to the ballpark just to see us practice. We would whip the ball around the infield with such precision, they'd applaud. Okay, so now you're thinking about that question on the yellow sticky note. Why did the umpires make so many mistakes when calling a Negro League game? In your journal, you are going to record a response to that question. Don't worry about the grammar or the format. I just want you to get your ideas out. Pause the screen and answer that question now. Did you get an answer? Okay, good. Let's discuss the answer and find evidence to support your conclusion. Did you say something like, they make mistakes because they're not used to the type of play that happens in the Negro Leagues? Well, let's see if we can find some evidence to support that conclusion. So I'm gonna go up here and find this evidence with you. It says, we played a different brand of baseball from the majors. The Negro baseball was fast, flashy, daring. All right, so that could be a great piece of evidence to support your answer. Staying on page 17 now, we're going to respond to a new question. Read this question on your own as I read it aloud. What do the umpires mean when they say, if they played like we did in the majors, they'd have to make the parks bigger to see all the fans? Do you see that in paragraph one? Right down here? Think about it now. What do they mean? And in your journal, record your response to this question. Remember, just get your ideas out. Let's discuss the answer and find evidence to support it. The umpires mean the Negro League style of play was very entertaining. Let's see how the text supports this conclusion. 
So we talked before in our last question about it being fast, flashy, and daring. That's another piece of evidence that could work here. Or maybe you highlighted this evidence. We would whip that ball around the infield with such precision, they'd applaud. That's a way it's entertaining. Or you could even talk about how sometimes they said it was even funny in the text. Those are some examples to support your conclusion. Wow, I'm noticing that the type of baseball played in the Negro Leagues is very different from the baseball that's played in the major leagues. Are you noticing that too? Now we're going to read a series of statements that reveal facts about the major leagues. We're then going to compare the major leagues with the Negro Leagues, thinking about what you read in second inning. Let's start with the style of play. Look up there. In Major League Baseball, pitchers are not allowed to throw the ball at a batter on purpose. Pitchers who do may get kicked out of the game. So now you're going to use your text on page 18. That's what I have right here open on the screen. If you have your text, you can open to that page now. You're going to use your text, specifically this paragraph right here, to answer this question. How is the Negro League style of play similar to or different from this aspect of the major leagues? You're going to pause the screen and you're going to write your answer. Remember, this is a quick write, so just get your ideas out. Do that now. You may have said how they are different because the Negro League had very few rules. Let's see if we can find text evidence to support that conclusion. You may have pointed out this piece of evidence right here. It says, in our league, everything was legal. There we go, very few rules. Or maybe you found this piece of evidence. The pitcher would knock you down just to mess with your head. Oh my goodness, that definitely does not seem like it was a very safe following lots of rules style play. Let's keep going and now we're going to talk about schedule. Now we're moving on to schedule. And on the screen, I have page 21. If you have your text, open to page 21 now. Let's read about the schedule in the major leagues. The major league baseball regular season runs from April until October. Players have several months off, then report to spring training, usually in February, where they practice to get ready for the regular season. So you are going to compare the schedule from the major leagues to the schedule for the Negro Leagues, thinking what's similar and what's different. To do that, you will use this paragraph from the text to help you. Use the text now to compare. Did you notice that the Negro League doesn't have spring training and that they play all year long? What evidence did you find? Let's go see. Right here, the first few sentences talk all about it. We didn't really have any spring training. We had to learn on the field. By springtime, we had already been playing down in Cuba or Mexico all winter. There wasn't any break. Okay, so you could have noted that for a difference in the schedule. We're going to stay on page 21 and this time talk about the umpires. Those are the people who make the calls in the game. So let's see what the umpires were like in the major leagues. In Major League Baseball, umpires 
are responsible for calling a fair, safe game. So, how are the Negro League umpires similar to or different from this aspect of the major leagues? Think about that, stop the screen, and write your answers down now. You should be using this paragraph of the text to find your evidence. Often, umpires in the Negro Leagues didn't make very good calls. On page 21, right over here, some of those guys, meaning the umpires, wouldn't have known a strike from their left foot meaning they weren't very aware and didn't make very good calls. Or you could have highlighted this piece of evidence down here, where it talks about an umpire who started a fight and even pulled out a knife. That seems like those umpires do not have the same responsibility as they do in the majors. Now we're going to talk about statistics. Baseball statistics are sometimes called stats, and it's really a way of record keeping. They play an important role in baseball. They help to document the progress of a player or of a team. So you're going to skim that fourth paragraph on page 21 down here, and you're going to think about the comparison between the majors and the Negro League. Let's hear about the majors first, though. In Major League Baseball, teams hire people to keep the statistics for each game. That's like the number of strikes or balls or the number of hits. So then the team will review these and study them after the game. So, just like you did before, answer that question. How is the use of statistics in the Negro League similar to or different from this aspect in the majors? Pause the screen and use that fourth paragraph to find your answer. Did you notice how the stats are not kept consistently in the Negro Leagues? Players or even reporters would be the ones to keep them. Make note of that answer on your paper if you didn't get it. Great work comparing the aspects of the Major Leagues to the Negro Leagues. This chapter has had us think about the difference in the style of play between the Negro League and the Major Leagues. Considering all we just talked about, what does the style of play in the Negro Leagues show about the league itself? Pause the screen to think about that. Maybe you pointed out how the Negro League is very dangerous and had fewer rules. Now we're going to think about the ways authors organize information in a text. In what ways do you know of how authors organize information? You could share with someone if you're working with them now. As we continue to read We Are the Ship, we will look at how the author organizes the chapters using text structures. Text structure refers to how information within a text is organized. Go ahead and pause the screen to record this definition wherever you're keeping the vocabulary for this module in your journal. Authors use different text structures to help them organize and convey their main ideas and key details. Thinking about how a text is structured helps you, as the reader, to organize the information to better understand the text. We will focus on how authors use different text structures to organize and convey their main ideas and details. So let's dive into a few different text structures together. The first type of text structure we're going to explore is comparison and contrast. This image is up here to help you remember what comparison and contrast structure is all about. Two things are being compared. You have thing one, thing two, 
And then what's similar about these is also discussed. So start a new page in your journal. Entitle it Text Structures. You can write comparison and contrast and then draw this diagram to help you remember what this text structure is all about. This is an example of comparison and contrast text structure used in this text. I'm going to read you the excerpt and your job is to think about what's happening in the text. All right? Rube ran his ball club like it was a major league team. Most Negro teams back then weren't very well organized. Didn't always have enough equipment or even matching uniforms. But not Rube's team. They were always well equipped with clean, new uniforms, bats, and balls. So, I said this was comparison and contrast. What two things are being discussed? Think about that now. Hmm. So, most Negro teams are being discussed as well as Rube's team. Okay? So, now, what information do we have about most Negro teams? Look at the text and see if you can figure out what information we have. Okay, we know that they didn't always have enough equipment or even matching uniforms. Okay, what information do we have about Rube's team? Hmm, Rube's team were always well equipped with clean, new uniforms, bats, and balls. So we're comparing and contrasting Rube's team with most Negro teams. Let's move on to another structure. This structure is descriptive text structure. Descriptive text structure provides a clear picture of a topic. So here we have the topic in the middle, okay? And in the reader's mind, they can really visualize that topic because the author uses details to support the topic. Copy this definition, an image of descriptive text structure on that page where you're recording text structures. You'll reference this in our next few lessons. Let's look at an example of descriptive text structure. This is taken from We Are the Ship. I'm going to read this excerpt and your job is to think about what's happening. So in your own words, think about it. And the pitchers, they got their pitching instructions from Rube sitting in the dugout. He puffs signals from his pipe or nod his head one way to signal a play. One puff fastball, two puffs curveball. In this example, what is the topic? Hmm. It's pitchers, how they got their pitching instructions from Rube, and how he's sitting in the dugout. Okay? So then what details are used to support this topic? Oh, this idea of the puffs. How many puffs from his pipe is Rube using to signal it? Let's move on to our next text structure, chronological. The final structure that we're going to talk about today. This is an image to help you think about it. Chronological text structure gives information in order of when they happen. Copy the definition and the image into your journal. Now let's see an example. I'm going to read it, and your job is to think about what's happening. They say baseball was invented by a fellow named Abner Doubleday in the mid-1800s. In the mid-1860s, most professional baseball teams had only white players. By the late 1800s, Negroes began to disappear from professional baseball teams. 
In the early 1900s, there were many Negro baseball teams all over the Northeast and the South. So, does this give an example of things happening in order from first to next? Thumbs up or thumbs down? Yes, the dates in each sentence prove the events are being told in the order they happen. So, we have this idea of when it began in the mid 1800s, talks about it over time to the early 1900s. That's chronological text structure. Now we're moving on to our next activity. After reading the first few chapters in We Are the Ship, we are going to stop and we're gonna jot down one to two main ideas of that chapter. And we're also going to record the text structure that that chapter is mostly comprised of. Remember, understanding the text structure can help us to understand the main ideas. So in your journal, you are going to open up to a blank page. So everyone find a blank page in your journal now. You are then going to divide your paper into three columns, just like what's on the screen. You will label the first column chapter and title, the second column main ideas, and the third column text structure. Let's set your paper up now. Get your journal or your electronic workspace and create your three columns now. Pause the screen. Okay, so we're going to start with the main ideas column and we're going to start for first inning, which was the first chapter in We Are the Ship. We're going to record what that chapter was mostly about, the main idea or ideas. You can use your notes from lesson five to help you do this. So find your notes where you recorded the summary of the first chapter, which was called First Inning. Here is what I included in my main idea summary. This chapter is mostly about the start of the Negro League's baseball teams that were created for black baseball players. Be sure to jot down what you have for the main idea in that second column. Now we're gonna move on and we're gonna talk about text structure. Nelson supports this main idea through the use of his text structure. I'm going to model determining the text structure for the first chapter of We Are the Ship, first inning. Okay, listen as I do this. Chapter one is organized in chronological order. Look back at your notes and see, do you agree? Why or why not? Nelson explains in the order events happened, what happened. He explains the events that led to the start of the Negro Leagues. For example, he talks about baseball, which was being invented in the 1800s. Then he moves to the 1860s when most professional teams had only white players. He continues this structure throughout the first chapter. Copy down in your chart the text structure that Nelson used for chapter one. Pause the screen so you can copy that down. Now you are going to do, about, do this for main idea and text structure as we think about second inning. Okay. The first thing you're going to record are the main ideas in the main ideas column for second inning. So on your paper, write second inning, a different brand of baseball under the chapter title. Do that now. Your thinking work is to determine the main idea of second inning a different brand of baseball and put it in the second column right here, okay? Look through your notes. You can skim the text if you have it. What 
is the main idea of second inning. Did you get it? If you're working with someone else, now you can share the main idea. So what is second inning mostly about? This is mostly about the way Negro League players played the game and the differences between the Negro Leagues and the majors. We just compared a lot of different things. Style of play, schedule, umpire, statistics. I recorded that main idea in the column. Make sure you get it down as well. So now it is our job to determine the text structure of second inning. Hmm. Look back through your notes and think, what text structure does Nelson mostly use throughout this chapter to support the main ideas? When you get it, jot it in that third column. Did you say comparison and contrast text structure? Nelson uses this structure. He describes the styles of play in the Negro Leagues and to the majors. For example, he talks about how play was much rougher in the Negro Leagues, but much nicer in the majors. Be sure you have the text structure of comparison and contrast written down so that you can reference it later. It should be in that third column. Nice work today. We will continue to look at how Nelson organizes information in this text and begin comparing and contrasting the structures of different chapters as we read We Are the Ship. Before we move to that, though, let's be sure we know why text structure is important. You are going to reflect on the impact of text structure, okay? I want you to answer these questions. Why does Nelson use this structure to organize the information in this chapter? And how does Nelson's use of this structure help you better understand the style of play in the Negro Leagues? Stop and record a quick write in your journals to these two questions. We're not going to answer them together today, but we're going to revisit this idea in future lessons. As we end this lesson, let's bring it all together to discuss that style of play of the Negro League baseball teams. All of this was talked about in second inning. So why do you think the Negro Leagues had such a different style of play from the major leagues? If working with someone, share your thoughts now. I think they wanted to stand out and get people interested in watching their games. They were playing under different conditions and they didn't have the same rules. This is our focusing question. How can sports create opportunities for change? How does the unique style of play in the Negro Leagues, connect to our focusing question. In the next lesson, we will explain how Kadir Nelson uses evidence to support his research in We Are the Ship. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us at info at greatminds.org. And I appreciate learning with you today. Please reach out if you have any questions.